Hello everyone, welcome to Azure Centric on our Azure Weekly Updates. Today we are live streaming to Facebook as our experimental uh, podcast show and let's see how all the things goes. Um, so after this, if you're seeing this podcast, it's because we were successfully if you see this on YouTube, and if you listen in, <laughs> in if you don't see it, then it probably wasn't successful. Yeah, and if you only see in 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 Facebook, it's because it never happened in <laughs> in the YouTube no, channel. We don't know anything about what you're exactly. Doing. We don't know all of these you're not things. Testing in production here at all. So. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so that's okay. Uh, it is. It is what it is. So my name is Marcos Nogueira. I'm your host on Azure Centric, and with me, I have that beautiful face. Look at that, with that beautiful uh, headset uh, from Microsoft, the Surface, whatever Absolutely. it is. I still had to pay full retail, though. What's up with that? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, oh my God, what a week, right? Um, we are entering, yeah. we are ent we are finishing, a, we finish a week. Um, this today, it's, it, it's Monday, right? And in a few hours, we'll have Ignite. Right. Uh, it starts kind of late tonight, um, kind of the the pre-shows. There's always all the uh, – I, I have to admit, I miss going to um, the in-person venues to kind of meet everybody and, uh, you know, shake hands and give out a couple of hugs and uh, have a few adult beverages and uh, really enjoy yourself out on the road but uh i'm also looking forward to the virtual meet and greets and absolutely uh, it's going to be really cool there's some cool stuff um you're doing a couple of things i'm doing a couple of things um we should do one together <laughs> <That> would... <laughs> yes i have that a, cap, a couple of round point. tables right i have a couple of round tables yes um and i'm looking forward um looking forward to it so it's going to be a good a good in this case um i think event absolutely but this week as a kind of a pre-ignite right we have quite a bit of 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 updates but we don't have i i found a team i don't know if you agree with me but i found a team that is the azure team yeah i'll, I'll agree with that yeah it was there was a <laughs> There was a lot of everything um, it this is. week, and it, it's kind of tough. I would say uh, thirty-five percent networking. Yes, it's not the majority, but it's 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 a consistent theme. Yeah, yeah, it's a consistent theme. Let's let's go but this there, way. There's some cool um, GA updates. But there's also, uh, and we kind of saved a little bit of the best for last. There is a really cool preview feature that's yes. released for public preview for this week. That so, is, that is. Um, but it's not not on purpose because we just follow the 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 the, the launch of all of those updates. Exactly, right? yeah, and it's not on purpose. We we just work with what Azure Blog gives us. Exact, exactly. So. Um, with this, I don't have my my favorite button, right? But if you like what you see so far, don't forget to subscribe. <laughs> exactly. We changed the setup. Which cameras? We changed the setup. It's it's going to be experimental. But if you like what you see so far, don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to send some love. Um, we are here for you. And above all, we are here to have a lot of fun. So Absolutely. nothing more than a live show, uh, just demonstrate that we hit the button and we hope for the best. <laughs> <laughs> so let's roll and let's jump to the first update. Okay, here we go. The first update. I so, love it. first update is the Azure Azure 
monitor log analytics and application insights. Support for availability zones is now general available on West US too. And oh my God, I got this right without even, even doing anything wrong, but it's used um, it's used to just doing all of that. So we have probably that is the best way to do it, right? That looks amazing. That's perfect. I figure if I have trouble reading it in the video presentation, it probably is even smaller. That's okay. Yeah, so this is a really cool update. And thank you everybody for being patient as we learn to use our new tools as well. Um, the only difference between a professional and an amateur is the ability to pretend like nothing happened. <laughs> so, exactly. <laughs> so uh, with this update here, uh, for the mission critical apps and data, this is really going to uh, provide a lot more support capabilities for Azure Monitor Log Analytics and App Insights, right? So this means that now we have a higher availability in our log for logs in our workspace. So uh, it's very important because uh, as we move kind of down through those tiers, we need that law the the logs and we need the workspace itself to be high availability so that Azure Monitor can accurately get that data. Uh, in a very timely fashion and alert the team to anything that they need to be aware of. Absolutely. And now it's on West US too. Absolutely. So it means that all of this is available uh, for, for availability zones on the region of West US too, which is pretty good because, because That's now- That's a very big region. A lot, exactly, is one, uh, one of the biggest regions and now it's it's those type of things that we've been talking all the time uh, in 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 our show in our podcast that basically goes and starting to use this without any problem now on West US too right and and, and with that allow us to just basically uh, going on West US too and allow us to use Azure Analytics uh, without any issues right. Exactly. Yeah. And it's it's really important that we, we kind of underscore that because Azure Monitor is natively as a, a software as a service, kind of a, yeah. it's somewhere between PaaS and SaaS really for Azure Monitor. But Absolutely. once you're in that ecosystem, everything you use should be high availability to ensure that it's consistent. And okay. the, the other piece with that, uh, less Azure Monitor, but more log analytics is bringing those logs into uh, analysis tools like Azure Sentinel um, really brings a lot of consistency and redundancy, which is critical in security operations, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Moving to the next one is the general availability of Azure Backup now supports archive, tie, archive tier through the Azure portal. So this was recent uh, announcement, right? That Microsoft saying that to retain backups for a longer uh, terms, in this case, longer duration on the very cost effective way. So this allows you to put those backups, uh, especially those fully backups and all of that on an archive tier that is the cheapest that you can find on Azure, which is pretty cool um, because now you can save a lot of money and, and, and specifically uh, moving those illegible uh, um, recovery points, uh, for example, to a different tier, uh, the older one, so you are not incurring on bigger costs. And also of this, this is um, supported uh, by the SQL Server and the SAP ANA uh, virtual machines. So it's not a small thing, right? No, right? So they've really taken a lot of steps to make sure that all of those prerequisites and requirements have been met in the back end with Azure, which is a really big undertaking. Um, you know, SQL Server is a very demanding architecture when it comes to availability and hardware uh, latency, especially. 
But I would also say exactly the same thing for the SAP HANA certified uh, systems. So moving to the archive tiering, of course, it means uh, it's available to store that information in the backup. So it doesn't have to meet kind of that super low latency, large capacity uh, kind of tiering. But at the same time, we all know SAP HANA databases can hit terabytes in size pretty darn easily for uh, an enterprise organization. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's critical to have that because now allows the tool to be good as, as it is and yeah. cheap because exactly. it's cheaper in this well, case. Well, yeah, cheap. it helps to lower the cost. So you can set, absolutely. for example, like 30 days in the hot tier and then for archive or cold tiering, anything over 30 days and then you expire it as needed, right? So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. really helps control cost overall. Absolutely. The next one, it's a, a very cool one, I have to say. That is the general availability of Express Route IPv6 support for private peering. And and curious or not, we have this conversation not a long time ago with one of our customers, right? Yes, um, not that long or ago. with with the customer. Um, that he was talking about express route and all of that and establish the communication by using, in this case, the PGP, uh, right? The BGP uh -huh. uh, using IPv4 and IPv6 subnets or in, the, in, the, in this case in both, right? Exactly. So, yeah. It's, it's nice to have that support. It was until now only IPv4. Uh, but now with IPv6, allow us to expand because especially when you have those types of, of big networks and you have a lot of those devices and it's more like for, it's not for every single company, I have to say, but more for if you are using a lot of IoT because you have a sprawl of devices, right? It's funny, have... I was thinking the same thing. Yeah, exactly. there's so many customers that we've seen that have hundreds of thousands of sensors, IoT yeah. devices. They're collecting that data. We want to maintain that flexibility of the IoT architecture. So it's kind of open. You need a sensor, add a sensor kind of a mentality. But at the same time, we want to keep them on network. So the data transmission itself is secured as well, right? Yeah. And some customers require it be on-prem networking, which means express route. And when we're talking about many hundreds of thousands of sensors, if you think large manufacturing facilities, they can easily exceed one, two million sensors for all of the production lines, capacities, different pieces of machinery. Um, uh, uh, yeah, it just goes on. But being able to use the IPv6, and this isn't just for new, express route um, connections. This also scales back to existing express route connections. So you can add or overlay the IPv6 to that connection now and become yeah. compliant with that standard. So you can you can utilize it between Azure Cloud and your on-prem. Absolutely. And, and because of that allows you to even coexist with your existing, like you're saying, IPv4. So even if you have IPv4 right now, it's just a matter to enable for IPv6. So you, now you can have that. And this is not the express route that supports IPv6. This is more for the private peering. So Correct. if you want to extend your devices that you have on-premise, connecting to the private peering instead of using the public peering. So the the... The services, the Azure service that they are public, right? Um, you can now create the private peering, so a, a pub, a, a, an IP internally within your network without going on outside, right? To just pass through the um, uh, through the express route to going. For example, uh, um, some database that you need to interact. For example, some of those services that you need to interact and now you can create a private peering okay with using in this case the ipv6 to be able to communicate 
because we know that sometimes going from IPv6 to IPv4, there is some, some performance uh, impact and sometimes depending on, on what you are talking about, right? It's not even possible, right? We Great. saw and these. We saw these on 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 the floor. Exactly. And one of the things, um, as I take a bit of a brief look at some of the details inside this, is we have to be always, of course, be cautious. But make sure that you make these changes inside of a, a proper approved change window. There can be impact, and anytime we're changing, especially a configuration of private peering. If you're using zone redundant gateways, you can actually enable this still and stay zone redundant with your private peering. So it's pretty cool, but it can take up to one hour um, per the documentation to take effect. So just to be aware, um, enable it. There might be some other impact, perhaps latency or something. Well, things are reprovisioning uh, inside Azure. So we just have to make sure we're careful with those things like always. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So moving to the next one, we have the general availability of Azure governance policy for Azure Key Vault. So this one, it's really, really good because now we have Azure governance. That is always one of the topics that when we talk with customers, we always bring to their attention. And now we have a policy for the Azure Key Vault. So allow us to do a lot of type, a lot of another layer of policy, okay? That reach the GA. I remember talking over this in, in, in one of the previous uh, podcasts, one of the previous shows about the importance, okay? Of um, the this policy for Azure Key Vault. And now a uh, few, weeks i have to say or a few months after here it is on ga so now it's the time to use this exactly right, right? so I'm, I'm gonna pull this right out but this capability is a big step towards commitment in simplifying secure secrets management in azure but it also enhances policy enforcements that we can define on the key vaults, key secrets, and certificates. So a little bit of a hint about what we should be using Azure Key Vault to help us with, keeping things secure, but also wrapping good governance around it and enforcing that governance through Azure policy. So absolutely. It's really closing the ecosystem on this one. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the part that we all like it, right? Because it's the part that we are uh, talking about all of this governance, all of these policies, and is one of the other ones that, that we are doing. Because now what you can do is you can even search it. You don't need to enforce it, this one, right? You can use what it is, the, the built-in there, to just kind of in audit mode, let's call it this way, to just visualize uh, what it is not compliant with the policy that, that you are applying. And by, by that, you can basically see what is going on with your Azure Key Vaults, right? If you really need to lock down your environment, then your Azure policy is being it can be applied as enforce it and now you are you are enforcing those those policies right oh absolutely yeah i mean uh, azure policies uh, as designed <laughs> it helps us to make sure that we're uh, securing and preventing problems um, yeah. as part of that full ecosystem for governance absolutely absolutely so moving to the next one and now we have a, a combination of tools that they are really close to each other is the extent of regional availability for private link UDR support. So now what we are saying is we have this extended regional um, availability 
for private link UDR. Uh, we have a lot of regions that we are using this. We have, again, the, the, the property of the private endpoint network policy uh, that is using for the Unify uh, UDR, it's Unify, uh, no, not Unify, user um, direct route, right? Something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, if you user define routes, user it's defined there route. on the screen, and I could not even read it. Oh my God. So I thought maybe I was on the wrong article for a moment there. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little worried, but I thought, oh, whatever, we'll find. So, whatever. It's yeah. There. So, yeah, the, so user defined routes are used to control routing and essentially to capture the traffic and force it to a certain path that we want it to yeah. take. So we think of default uh, internet path or just a default path that's really part of uh, a CLZ deployment and how we capture everything and funnel all of the traffic through where we want it to go in that case. And it's no different for private link. We want to capture certain routes and we do that using UDRs. So. Yeah. Growing the availability for this is really um, part of that bigger overall commitment that we've talked about um, recently and often uh, about how Microsoft is making all features available across all regions. And uh, again, I'm going to quote the target as being, I don't know, maybe the next few years. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I should probably look that one up and uh, put it on one of my famous sticky notes. But uh, I think it's like 2025 or something like that, that all features are going to be available in all um, all regions of Azure, which it's a massive undertaking. So making the private link UDRs available is really important, right? So this is part of an overall, not just networking, but also a security strategy, making sure that we're controlling traffic, controlling the traffic routes, and there's no escape when we do UDR. So using a UDR overrides other features like BGP, for example, right? Absolutely. And, and it's not only that. It's like with this, the UDR, right? It's where you allow to doing and following what is uh, usually the best practice associated with the zero trust module, right? Mm -hmm. You, It's what you use to kind of not allowing the what is the left to right traffic so basically within the same vnet uh, all the subnets to going to a central location for example a firewall or something like that that it can, it, if it needs to go from one subnet to another subnet even within uh, the vnet you always come to the firewall to inspect that traffic and because a private link is something that usually use the backbone of Microsoft because it's a Microsoft service. Now you can uh, create, and a lot of times when you're doing that, it depends on the layer, you need to create that open port from the, from the, priv the service that you are using to the private link. And with this, in this case, in this case you can control that even using those services using the udr right and and that's the part that is exciting about this this uh, new uh, feature that azure f that is now on ga and is available for a lot of a lot of regions um out of the yeah, gate there's, right? there's quite quite a list of uh, of regions that it's available in yeah absolutely and and um, yeah, so basically the majority of the North America uh, regions, including Canada, okay, in this mm -hmm. case, not all Canada, but Canada Central, um, Europe, uh, Brazil, um, and uh, J Japan, Australia, and, and Asia as well. So basically cover, I don't want to say the main regions, but uh, usually the, the the biggest ones that we have in well, we, in yeah, Asia, we can, right? We can say quite a quite a lot of the the bigger regions around the yeah. world, and there'll be more to come. Absolutely. But, but this isn't the only kind of private link update that we have, right? No, it's not. It's not. the 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 next one that we have is the NSG. 
so it's exactly the same, but on NSG endpoint. So now that we have the UDR, okay, so now the UDR, um, it's where you're doing the private, uh, in this case, the routing. Over here, you are not doing the routing. You are controlling to the NSG. So NSG is a kind of a layer four kind of firewall. So mm -hmm. it's what we call at the present moment, a dummy firewall basically goes to the protocol. It's not the next gen firewall that it's what we call the intelligent ones, right? But allows the NSG for that lateral movement from, uh, in this case, the subnet within the same VNet, right? To just have, uh, have the, uh, the ability to control the traffic. So it's exactly. no longer to, through, um, through the UDR to routes, right? That we can use, for example, a central, um, a central uh, firewall, but now it's through the NSG. Exactly. So it's it's almost the same um, in this case, but it's it's on on NSG and well, on yeah, the other this, one. This one really stops or allows traffic. A UDR captures the traffic, right? Uh, Routes the traffic, yes. Yeah, routes the traffic into where we yeah, need it. This to go. one will stop the traffic. If you want to use this, the, the, the private endpoint will stop the traffic. Uh, exactly. And basically, that's that's the thing. And it's good because we have the two options. We can even so use can have, both. So you can right? have a UDR in place and then an NSG to block the UDP packets, but allow the TCP packets. For example. I just thought it would be fun to use a lot of TLAs in one sentence there. <laughs> couldn't help myself. <laughs> you couldn't help yourself, right? I'm. Uh, I was seeing that. That that's okay. No worries. No worries. See, life life makes no difference. I, I just no yeah. life. Yeah, that's what we. That's what I figured out. Live or no live, it's not going to to make a difference for us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm because I'm still, it's it's I'm still going to be the, the same. We just theory. press the button and. And here we go. Right? Exactly. Right? We're still <laughs> virtual, man. <laughs> oh my that is gosh. Awesome. I'm just so, playing here with the with a lot of those those things, right? Absolutely. You know what? I just want to say you've been doing a great job. Um, this uh for anybody watching and you know, watching a recording back and things like that. This is Marcos's first experience with this web-based tool. And yeah. it is not difficult but it is not easy to just pick something brand new up and just roll with it so yeah. going live day one kudos well done and this is part of what we enjoy doing together everybody. exactly it's, just it's trying new moments. stuff seeing how it works some of it works some of it maybe not so great but, but this has been actually a very enjoyable experience it's just working consistently so thinking of hitting the button and just going with it. We have a, a kind of our next update around Azure Spot. So virtual machine, try to restore functionality now button is now GA. So yeah. for anybody who's not familiar with Azure Spot, check it out. It's pretty cool. So it's a really good way to use for um, kind of batch based workloads, occasional workloads, ones that aren't dependent on consistent uptime. And the reason that I say those things is because Azure Spot kind of fits into leftover available infrastructure space in Azure data centers. So if I take up, uh, if there's 15 machine slots available uh, in this one allocation, I take up 14, Marcos says, hey, I just need one and I might need it for like four hours or something. So I'll use Azure Spot. It fits it into that one spot. But then if I grow my capacity and take it, he may lose his spot. And there's lots of other variables involved. There's lots of conditions as well. And you can uh, set different thresholds and costs and payments, all kinds of different um, configuration with uh, within the Azure Spot kind of purview. But... Uh, in this case, we're talking about the easy and quick ability to simply restore. 
And uh, this is kind of a cool thing, right? Because what happens uh, with this restore functionality is we can configure um, the number of attempts to restore Azure Spot machines that are evicted due to capacity restrictions, kind of like I was explaining there. And then uh, the other thing it can do is improve the lifespan of your Azure Spot virtual machine so that workloads can run for longer durations. So again, this is another um, add to the feature set within Azure Spot to give us a little bit more consistency and configuration uh, within this uh, uh, service offering, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Because Azure Spot is, is not for your, um, like you mentioned, it's not for your um, production workloads, let's call it this way. Yeah, don't it's provision for you SQL to Server test. on one of these. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because uh, you might be in Vict, you are just using, right? What, what Azure is not being consuming. And it's great for, for quick tests, something that you are not too much of a concern of uh, losing all of the, 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 the testing and all of that. It is great to test all of this because you are consuming on a cheaper level exactly the same, um, exactly the same compute. Um, that 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 Azure still have available uh, at, at way cheaper um, in this case price. Exactly. Although the caveat on all of these, right, it's is sometimes. is the sometimes you might get surprised because you might get that information, right, um, that you've been evicted. And exactly. Because you never know that someone else wants to really pay the price, in this case, the full price, they pay and the full price you and get that possibility. A, bit of a, a cut rate, we get a discount. We don't pay the full price with Azure Spot, but we help Azure to sell out the rest of their available infrastructure or resources in this case, right? Yeah, and, and so, it's very smart of them, I have to say. It is, it's a great way to sell the leftovers kind of a thing. Um, I don't they always have They have the compute there yeah, available. So, so I actually use Azure Spot for a lot of my own testing. Oh, me too, me too. Because a lot it, of that. it stretches way those credits a lot further. And I don't need, like if that machine dies, I don't really care. I just yeah. spin up another Azure Spot and rerun all my PowerShell and okay, fine. My lab's back to where I need it to be. Exactly. That's, cool. that's I where. Spent five bucks instead of 50. That's where the PowerShell and automation or templates, it's so critical for this. So that, that's a bit of a story, right? Because that's absolutely. also um, part of the Azure Spot ecosystem that is our responsibility as the user of those that we need to use them responsibly. So we can't phone Microsoft support, for example, and say, hey, guys, you know, my, my Azure Spot VM just up and got evicted, but uh, I was halfway through Exchange Server install on it or whatever, right? And it's a well, yeah, it was Azure Spot, so... Yeah, don't do that. But also, please don't install Exchange Server on Azure VMs. But <laughs> you know. absolutely, and then and then they will become Kennedy and say, "I'm sorry, sir, but you should not say you should not do that." Right? <laughs> exactly. Let me direct you to a couple of different Microsoft Docs articles that will help you understand. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I get I'll get a taste of my own medicine in that case, right? <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. As as the next one, right? As the next one uh, update is the Zerto disaster recovery for Azure VMware solution. So mm -hmm. Zerto is is one of the tools that I did use in the past that allows you to do a lot of those type of things, especially in especially the part of uh, migrating those VMs from on-premise um, uh, to Azure, in this case, and from VMware to VMware locations, and a lot of those type of things like the PV2, the V2V, and something like this, right? So it's it's been, I've been using a lot on the disaster recovery, 
Uh, and now the possibility of using this for the Azure VMware solution, the AVS, it's tremendous mm -hmm. because it's another tool that everyone that have VMware is well familiar. Um, and now it's available to just build that continuous data protection, right? From your VMware on-premise solution to AVS uh, that is exactly. on Azure. Yeah, as you, as you know, last winter, I was part of a really large scale project with on-prem to AVS migration. And I thought that I had, uh, let's say, I, I felt like I had about a 60% grasp of a lot of the back end tools. So enough to do design, enough to do lots of different things and work my way through the rest of the engineering. So I took a, I took a bunch of courses really quick and got my engineering up to snuff. And what I learned very quickly is that there's a lot of supplemental tools, just as much on kind of the Microsoft side as the VMware side. And I kind of think of them coming together in that partnership in this way. And I really thought that the AVS platform had done a really good job of staying open for different tools. Because we did in that within the scope of that project integrate not Zerto but another product, and uh, we also used a lot of native VMware tools, and it came together really really well. Um, I was super super uh, well. I was super pumped <laughs> to be honest. Um, it was just an exciting project, and to see Microsoft working so hard with our teams on that project to build their compliance with everything and mesh everything together. It was so refreshing for me. You know, we, we talk about it often, but this one got me thinking about how Microsoft is so open and Absolutely. they want to partner with all of these other vendors because they want us all to be able to meet our business requirements at the end of the day. I, and I don't think it's any, any bigger or any less than that. That's not an easy thing to do, meeting all those business requirements, but to meet business requirements for such a huge amount of customers is so difficult. And I think they just do a really good job. I, I'm sorry, I know it's a bit of a digression. I got excited about AVS there, but- No, 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 it, it, at all. Because it, it's it's all the things that you, we need to do it, right? It's 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 by, by doing that, we are, we are basically, uh, doing all of those type of, of things, it's it's the natural movement of the of the applications and the tools that we use on prem, even with with VMware that we want to have that integration with the cloud because if we have VMware solution running on premise and now AVS, right? We want that is the that is the purpose of the AVS, right? In the cloud, it's like it's an extension. I, I, I always, to simplify all of this and, oh, how you run VMware on Azure and all of that, I always come to um, a way, a kind of a, a way to explain to the customer uh, how is this work. It's like, imagine that you are building a new VMware solution on a different data center because it's literally what you are doing. It is. Right? It's a bare metal solution, right? It's a bare Azure, metal solution. Azure provides a rack server. Well, somebody does. Azure <laughs> manages the rack server. Yeah. And when you subscribe to AVS, and please be careful, um, it's freaking expensive because you're getting bare metal servers in an Azure data center. So um, it's not for the faint of heart, but it is to empower businesses to do lift and shift operations with you know the minimal amount of refactoring right this yeah. is about rehosting not refactoring and that's what it's intended as it's not intended as a permanent solution yeah. unless that's part of your planning but it's built to provide a way to get out of your on prem and into azure then yeah. deal with the next steps in your project. Absolutely. And yeah, it's absolutely awesome because you, you, anyways, 
Yeah, so you you get this. But it awesome is, but look at this. The tool right? the tool allows you to do exactly what you are uh, familiar to do it. So, for example, you are allow on premise, right, from a VM site to another VM. Yes, exactly. you have other tools to do that. Even the native tools of VMware that allows to do that, but allows you to do it from the AVS to an, to uh, another AVS solution from a cloud-based disaster recovery. So if you have a, an AVS on one region, for example, and you have another AVS on another region, this tool allows you to have that disaster recovery if that is required. But it also, that is the part that you can do it right now. It allows you to move from the Azure virtual machines, in this case, not a virtual machine, sorry, the VMware virtual machines from AVS to uh, Azure IS. So even if you want to just having those virtual machines, uh, in this case, those workloads, to be able to protect those, uh, you can even use Zerto to just replicate that to an Azure virtual machine that basically is an Hyper-V. So it does the conversion from VMware to Hyper-V because we know that Azure running Hyper-V. So allows you to have a lot of flexibility on the things that it really depends. Of course, that on a disaster recovery, it really depends on criticality of the app, right? Uh, what is the RTO, what is the RPO, all of those type of things, right? Exactly. That, that, that will basically create a solution around it. Of course, that the most expensive one that I'm seeing over here probably is AVS that you're running on Azure to another AVS for a cloud discovery. This allows you to do it, and that's the interesting part, probably, from... Uh, uh, an AVS from one region to another one. Probably is the most expensive because like you mentioned, you need two AVS to be able to do it on different regions. Yeah. And one of them... on the scale of the enterprise as well though, right? So exactly. Running but, an AVS data center is a lot cheaper than running your own physical data center, for example, even in a colo situation, right? Absolutely. So, there's a lot of enterprises out there that have multiple colo regions, uh, even across North America, to provide a little bit of physical redundancy. And yeah. this is a great alternative um, to get out of that colo space and be able to still take advantage of cloud scale. You can scale it up and you can scale it down yeah. within hours. Um, yeah. I've I've done it many times for a few different clients now. And Absolutely. It's awesome. It's so easy to use. It is so easy. And it's not like when when we talk and probably you are that you are listening to this, you are you say, but okay, but why I need two AVS, one on one region and the other one on region? It's not like one is on and the other one it's it's kind of a standby. No, you can leverage both, right? Absolutely. You can have some workloads running on one. You can have the other workloads running on the other. You well, have you a lot of service that does the load VNets. balancing. Yeah, well, you, and, you peer the two regions together uh, on your VNets, and you've you've got these networks now that operate as one, so you have multi-region redundancy. You can have hot, hot, high availability in absolutely. VMware geographically separated. Yep. So, it, I mean, it, there's a bit more to it, but essentially, it's that easy. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> we say this often. You hear me say this all the time. Life is hard. We don't have to make it any worse. <laughs> AVS is here to help us make it a bit easier, at least. Right? Yeah. You and want a new data center? Go, go build one. <laughs> yeah. Or if you want, if you are patient, you can wait like nine months, two years for the server to build another another data center, right? So that's so. This is a good point. So Microsoft's procurement chain has taken care of all of those hardware problems on their side we it's transparent to us i'm sure somebody's pulling their hair out but i mean it's not not me, me. i already pulled my to, hair i have time. my own problems right yes so we're we do have a customer and 
they're having some procurement challenges like everything. I was actually talking with another client this afternoon and they were saying, well, we need to order, you know, X hundred laptops. Uh, what are the challenges we can expect? And of course, I have to say to them, well, uh, you can expect some delays for number one, but there, there's different tricks that we have, but uh, there's no getting around it. There is nope. a chip shortage. It impacts us in a very real way. Networking equipment, uh, endpoint equipment, and server side equipment is all impacted quite heavily right now. So Azure provides us a way to work kind of around that a little bit as well, right? So uh, just I, not that I'm here to sell Azure, but I mean, that's that's it's a pretty selling. low hanging fruit right there, right? And it doesn't <laughs> doesn't take anybody smart. If I can figure it out, folks, you should already know. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So moving on to the next one. Now we have general availability, a lot of GAs mm. this week for Azure Functions extension for blobs, queues, even a service bus and event grid. So again. Um, a lot of the sets that allows you to trigger, okay, all of those, uh, the latest uh, Azure SDKs that is now on GA to covers all of those type the, the, that I mentioned, the Azure blobs, Azure queues, event uh, service bus, and event grid. So pretty cool that now you have those extensions available for Azure functions. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So we get a whole new set of triggers and bindings available with this update. And uh, the fact that it's GA to all regions is pretty cool. Uh, not the least of which the thing that really gets me excited in this one is both event hubs and event grid, uh, because uh, now our Azure functions that are uh, triggered, for example, on events and Sentinel, we can actually go back to that data and add new functionality to our data gathering as part of automated research, for example, on an incident. So this can be a really powerful um, kind of piece of the puzzle uh, as we utilize it with some of our other complementary tools. Absolutely. Absolutely. I say complementary, but they're not free. I should point that out. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> they are definitely not free. Uh, 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 with that, <laughs> money back guarantee as always, right? <laughs> yeah, on this on this channel, yes, absolutely, yes. You get back whatever you paid to watch this podcast, no problem. <laughs> 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 and and maybe we should qualify that if you paid to watch this podcast, we're really sorry that <laughs> you got ripped off. <laughs> yes, we really are sorry about that. The next one <laughs> is the general viability of ephemeral OS disks for Azure VM support additional VM sizes. So this is pretty cool. What's your opinion about this? <laughs> I was going to take a sip of coffee. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so this one's actually really awesome, right? So this is about uh, kind of temporary disks or uh, the VM cache, right? And yep. this enables those ephemeral OS disk to be created for all the VMs and they don't have to have that cache, right? So if you have an insufficient cache, but you have sufficient temp disk on the host, now you can kind of work together with those, right? So you can, uh, you can use the ephemeral OS disk to kind of supplement it and help with that. And one of the things that this can really help with, um, and I've, I've used this often is, you know, sometimes we right size the choice of our uh, virtual machine and it gives us a bigger cache disk or that temp disk. And yep. we want to have more temporary data. We don't need to keep it. Anything we write to that temporary disk, it disappears um, kind of randomly when we reboot that machine, right? But we should not count on that data to be there any longer than, you know, maybe a few minutes or something like that, right? I can't remember off the top of my head what the actual time suggestion is for that. I think it's less than one hour is the suggested time. But yeah. uh, thank you, for, I appreciate that because I was trying to remember. So for these, you know, we may have um, different operations we do. We might be, um, let's say media, processing media, for example, right? So you want to process a video podcast. Maybe you, uh, you 
bite off these small sized files, you write them to the temporary disk, then you grab them back, you stitch them together to write a permanent file that you're going to then upload to YouTube or something, for example, because you get uh, Azure's internet backbone, which is wicked fast. Yes, it is. It is wicked fast. And that's the, the good part of all of this uh, ephemeral disk, like you mentioned, it's, it accelerates basically, uh, especially if you are a re-image those VMs uh, on the on the on the scale set, for example, uh, and that is crucial. For example, if you are doing uh, AKS that use the VM scale sets instances, so you are using all of that ephemeral disk to allow you support. Uh, additional and and even on the sizes, right? So now, um, such as the 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 D series and the E series that you have, um, allows you to be faster and to have more IOPS because now the ephemeral disk can read the cache, can use the cache, right? Exactly. Like like you mentioned, and now they are way more faster to achieve to achieve that. So. It's good because we had that disk a lot of times there that was not doing anything, and let's put it use. Basically, it's 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 how I see this update coming, right? Exactly. Yeah, it's it's something that's always bothered me a little bit. It's it's kind of like adding an NVMe to your desktop and then never using it. You've got <laughs> exactly. this nice high end storage available. You've paid for it. Yeah. And then you just leave it breaking there fast. Just, but no. you don't use it. Right. It's like the coffee cup holder that used to come in the top of my desktops all the time. Right. What do you do with that? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I had to add that one. That's okay. <laughs> Moving to the last one. Public preview on multiple backups per day for Azure files. And how beautiful is to end this, this show to this week with this one. Right. Yeah, we were a little public preview. It's uh, on these multiple backups per day. Allow us not to have only one backup and these four files. So if you want more than one, right, uh, we can trigger those jobs to align to the schedule to have multiple times uh, those those files to be able to backup, especially those uh, share content files, right? Um, on the organization that they do it more frequently than once per day. Yep, it's really awesome because you can now create the policy um, in your in your um, Azure files to trigger a backup, uh, for example, like every four hours. And yep. this is really great. Like you say, the, you know, you could even take it down to like every two hours or something and uh, provided the options available, I should say that. But... Yep. Um, it's, it's so useful, especially for larger shares. And when you think about kind of that Monday to Friday, nine to five, that's really disappeared from most workplaces. So being able to capture, for example, kind of that seven to seven, that really, uh, kind of encapsulates more of what a normal work day is now, I think for most organizations, hopefully, uh, you guys aren't like us, you're not working a 12 hour day. We want everybody to work eight hours or less. It's much better for your mind. It's much better for your body and all of those things. But from an organization backup perspective, we have to make sure we are capturing that full day, right? So you see, I was able to get back on track there this time. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. No worries. But it is like with, with this low RPO, um, it's, it's basically you are aligning uh these files that usually it's on a share con uh, on a share um it's the example that they are giving on the share uh, uh file share content uh, on organizations that they, they they have a lot of changes right allows you to do that to be able to uh, um, align with the normal hours like you mentioned uh to doing that because if you're doing a um especially on those occasions that the, the, the file has been changing a lot and someone made a mistake or, 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 or delete it, at least you don't lose that much of work, right? 
because the only option that you have before this, um, and again, this is in private or a public preview. So don't yep, use this in not production. Not ready for production quite yet. Not ready for production yet, but it's something that you can start leveraging to see if it makes sense or not. At least the good thing about this is you will have uh, your policy ready when this becomes GA. Here you go. You just need to implement it, right? Exactly. See, it's features like these that make it easy for us to be able to recommend to our customers that we Absolutely. should be cloud native, Azure native solutions. And Absolutely. It makes the integration and the building of everything much easier um, as the architects and engineers and everybody's doing all of these things. But we can make this repeatable. It's when we have to integrate with third party solutions and there's a little bit of human involvement required that it makes it a bit more complex in that way, right? So this is another step towards better automation as well, because now that it's going to be policied once it hits GA, we can incorporate this into our ARM templates and away we go. Absolutely, my friend. Absolutely. And with that, we um we ending our our podcast. Uh, for this for this week, I'm looking forward for Ignite um, on the very very close hours. In this mm -hmm. case, I think it's tomorrow uh, because this is recorded again uh, on on Monday, um, or at least it's public on Monday. Uh, and on Tuesday is when Ignite starts. So um, at the end of this week, we'll have a gazillion of updates <laughs> to do it updates. uh let's try to do like a less than four hours podcast i think it's a well good we one. can always break it up and do a few live streams why not <laughs> true true not 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 bad idea not bad idea but don't forget to subscribe the channel don't forget to send us the love um this is again was an experience uh Share with us what, what you guys think about this. If I was good or not, I was trying to be as smooth as as possible. But a lot like of butter, things, new it's things like to butter. learn, and butter, and exactly. only improving from here, right? <laughs> I thought we did fine. Uh, I did. I did fine. Show you're doing all the hard work, clicking on making everything <laughs> transition. So for me, it's been pretty easy. I just had to show up this time. It was kind of nice. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So I hope that I can see you next week and bye for now.